I evaluated about 10 or 15 different cover crops in uh, like 1999, I believe was the year we started that. And from that, I noticed that field peas did very well in the fall in wheat stubble. Uh, and they grew a lot of biomass and uh, seemed like I liked the soil quality. But I realized that a monoculture cover crop could be improved on significantly after I, uh, other producers were incorporating other covers into their mixes or other plant types. So what I tried to do then was take uh, that legume crop and add some brassicas to it. So I added uh, radish and turnip in that mix. Uh, and what I really loved about that is then the radish and turnip uh, would thrive in soil environments that the peas did not. So like if we had high pH or high salt areas, they would encroach in those salt spots and continue to use water and scavenge nitrogen and do all those things. And that's kind of how I got started down the track of using more plants in my cover crop mixes. Uh, because every time I add one, for the most part, it seems like it's a benefit. Yeah, in my operation, how I treat my cover crops, assuming we get moisture and that we raise some cover crops and get some good biomass out there, which I have had very, uh, very good results over the years. Uh, I've only had a couple years in the last 17 years of raising cover crops that I've had a significantly reduced uh, stand of covers because of drought. How I handle them once I have biomass production in the field is I either leave them totally uninterrupted, and that's one of the things that the BioStrip Till has helped me. If, if I have a lower residue biomass where I'm gonna plant the corn and the high, higher residue biomass in between the corn row, that, that's one of the aspects. So BioStrip Till is a way of managing the residue amounts or the residues, the cover crops that you raise in, in, in a cover crop mix for next year's planting. Uh, the other thing that, and this works really good, if you have access to livestock, uh, grazing the biomass from cover crops in the fall, late in the fall, is just a super way to use that. And I, I use this term a lot. There isn't very many times in life that one plus one equals three, but that's one case where you put soil moisture together and cover crop seed and you put that together and you can produce more than the, the sum you started with. And uh, livestock can utilize it and not affect the crop production uh, status of that ground by grazing it. So they can go in there and, and graze dairy quality livestock feed uh, for months. And, uh, and then you can come in there the next year and still produce uh, a really good crop. With the discussion of, of cover crops and residue management, uh, it, I, I found this to be a really interesting, and I, I struggled with it myself, is let's just say I have a, uh, an 80 bushel wheat stubble, and I have totally too much residue out there to raise next year's corn crop without having some issues with too wet and too cold of soils, okay, from all that residue. And there's even toxic effects from the wheat residue. I know that because it, there's a certain tonnage level you can get by with without having allelopathic effects from the wheat stubble affecting your next year's corn crop. And I'm like, okay, I've got all this residue out there, but here I am planting a cover crop in there and I'm growing more residue. Is this just gonna compound the problem? Uh, no, not if it's the right residue. So if you're using a, a, a low carbon, high nitrogen cover crop, uh, that canopy of that, of that cover crop in the fall will help break down that wheat stubble. And it just literally melts underneath that, that canopy of that cover crop. And then the, the high nitrogen cover crop then gives nitrogen on the soil surface for the biology to continue to feed on that wheat residue. So the biology wants the carbon, but they need the nitrogen source the protein and nitrogen source from the cover crop that you just produced to continue to feed on that cover. So I've actually uh, sped up 
the process of mineralization of that organic matter by, by raising more organic matter. And it, I, it's counterintuitive, but it works. And it, every cover crop producer that's gone through that cycle has seen that, and it's really fun to see that work. On the weed management side, cover crops, there's an aspect there that, that can help you. Let's just say that you're in a clean stubble system, which a lot of no-tillers, especially in the more arid areas of the country, uh, and, and I used to be when I was drier, I would keep my stubble clean, so I might do sp two spray applications in the fall. Uh, now I do one spray application right at harvest time, and, uh, and plant the cover crops, and then the cover becomes a weed, con weed control management system. And then another way we use covers for weed control is uh, we will include rye in our cover crop system. And I'll just give you an example. We'll broadcast rye in standing corn aerially, uh, and there's new methods of doing that. So you can do it with a ground rig. Uh, you can interseed it at, at uh, V, five through eight. Uh, there's lots of ways of getting this in there and getting it established, but the basic is to have rye over winter and uh, produce a biomass crop then in the springtime and then go in and plant your soybeans into this green residue uh, and rye has a well-known allelopathic effect on small seeded broadleaves especially. So uh, it will either keep them from germinating or reduce the, the uh, aggressiveness of them at the early stages. So it'll allow you to possibly, and it, it seems like it's working that way, to reduce your herbicide cost somewhat to raise rye as a, in rotation with soybeans. So there's another example of where you can use cover crops to actually potentially reduce your herbicide use and get better weed control. Whether or not to consider cover crops in, in a, in a no-till system uh, anymore, I don't think it's even a matter of whether you consider it. You just make it part of that program. Uh, it's, it just needs to be in there.